pull down your armrest and fasten your seatbelt. We're taking a trip back in time as American Motor Classics presents fabulous Fords of the 50s. You shake my nerves and you rattle my brain. Too much of love to have a man insane. You broke my wheel, but what a feel. Goodness gracious, great balls of fire. Henry Ford's influence on the American automotive industry is legendary. He built his own car in 1893 and worked as a consultant and designer for several other companies after that. In 1903, he formed the Ford Motor Company and introduced his first commercial vehicle, the Model A Ford. Over the next five years, Henry would try out enough new car designs to make alphabet soup until he hit upon the Model T in 1908. This was a car that would change the American way of life. Practical, durable, it would also become affordable. Henry's attempts to streamline production paid off in his ability to provide quality automobiles for less. America loved the Model T. The Tin Lizzie took them everywhere for 20 years. And when the old Fliver was replaced in 1928 with the new Model A Ford, people sang that Henry made a lady out of Lizzie. Ford continued to do what it did best right on through the 30s and 40s, providing reliable, comfortable, and conservatively stylish transportation for the average American. Car manufacturing came to a halt during World War II. We were too busy making tanks and planes to make cars, too. It wasn't until the very late 40s that America saw newly designed cars on its streets. The effect of this prolonged period without new cars resulted in a decade during the 50s when automotive styling would try out some of the most radical designs ever. Let's take a look at what happened at Ford during this period from 1950 to 1959, when people were proud to say, It's a Ford! Get the feel of a wheel of a Ford! Settle back, take a man, hold tomorrow in your hand. Get the feel of the wheel of a Ford! Feel the side as you drive, and your envy and your eye. It's the feel of the wheel of a Ford! Get the 
feel of a wheel of a fair lane, you'll know what it means to fly. Get the feel of a wheel of a Lincoln, you'll really be riding high. Ford wagons and new Edsels, they'll take you anywhere. Ford Customs and 500s have luxury to spare. Ford Galaxies and Mercuries, you're up among the stars. Ride the mighty Thunderbird, the royalty of cars. So to know how it feels to have wings on your wheel, get the feel of the wheel of a great automobile. Get the feel of the wheel of a Ford. Over a million 1949 Fords were built, the most for any model year since 1930. Longer and lower with coil spring independent front suspension, they were a dramatic change from the earlier styles and were popular with the buying public from the beginning. In 1950, Ford introduced the V8 Crestliner. Offered at $1,711, this special edition two-door was distinguished by vivid two-tone color panels on its sides with matching two-tone interiors and a padded vinyl top. By 1951, it had been produced in six color combinations. But only 26,304 Crestliners were sold before the series was canceled in 1952. These wildly colored cars are rare and desirable collectibles today. The rest of the 1950 Ford line was divided between deluxes and customs. Advertised as 50 ways new, 50 ways finer. They had lowered parking lamps, a new Ford crest bearing the family coat of arms, and the wishbone door handles were replaced with the push-button variety. Most were available with your choice of the six-cylinder or flathead V8 engine. The larger V8 engine displaced 239.4 cubic inches and was popular with the hot rodders. It also gave Ford a performance edge over Chevrolet and Plymouth. The 1951 Fords were slightly restyled, with the most notable changes being the dual spinner grille, a new winged hood ornament, slightly recessed headlamps, and side trim that wrapped all the way around the trunk and chromed wind splits on the sides that accented the new twin-pointed tail lamps. For the first time, the turn of a key started the engine, eliminating the starter button. And two-speed Fordomatic automatic transmissions were also offered for the first time. The Ford line was restyled for 1952 under the direction of styling chief George Walker, establishing the designs that would form the basis for Fords until 1955. The cars were lower and wider on a longer 115-inch wheelbase. They introduced the one-piece curved windshield and center fill fueling hidden behind the rear license plate holder. The front grille reverted to a center bullet, but with slotted vents on either side, flanked by spinners that housed the parking and turning lamps. Main line was the standard line, and custom line was the deluxe model. Crestline became the top of the line series, made up of the Victoria hardtop, the Sunliner convertible, and the posh new Country Squire station wagon. This was the first all steel Ford wagon with wood decal trim. 1953 was Ford's golden anniversary year. Despite this being their 50th anniversary, few significant changes were made in the line, except an increase in prices. The grill had been changed, and the flathead V8 was now capable of 110 horsepower at 3,800 RPM. In these early years of the 50s, Ford cars were interesting to the buying public and sold well, resulting in the manufacture of 1.2 million cars in 1953. This succeeded in moving Ford ahead of Chrysler into the number two sales spot behind Chevrolet. This increase in sales was partially accomplished by a sales blitz where, during its peak, a Ford could be bought at less than cost. Chevrolet was not damaged much by Ford's competitive push, but many of the independent makes were. The Ford Blitz is credited as one of the most important factors in the mid-50s decline of many of the independents, such as Studebaker, Nash, Hudson, and Kaiser Willys, who were unable to discount their cars as much. The 1954 Ford line was basically the same as 1953 with one important addition, the Crestline Skyliner Victoria hardtop. It had a front roof section made of transparent plastic 
And the old flathead V8 at long last gave way to a new overhead valve Y-block V8 engine with 130 horsepower. It was the hottest engine in the low-priced field. The 1955 Fords were new designs styled under the direction of Franklin Hershey. Bearing some resemblance to the 52-54 models, they were clean and highly chromed with a rakish look of motion. Notice how the line of the car flows from front to rear in an almost imperceptible curve, and how the front fenders, the reach of the visored headlights, and the drawn-out taillights extend this smooth, unbroken line. The lowered hood and the sweep of the all-round windshield blend into this line perfectly, adding to the lively feeling of motion in the overall appearance of this car. The same basic lineup was retained. Main line, custom line, station wagon, but a new line was added, Fairlane. Fairlane was available as a two and four door sedan, a two and four door hardtop, as well as the Fairlane Sunliner convertible. Another interesting addition was the Crown Victoria, developed from the Skyliner, but destined to only survive two years. Some featured the innovative plastic transparent top, divided from the rest of the roof by the Victoria's broad stainless steel band. They were attractive, but a little pricey, and not terribly practical on hot sunny days. More than 13,000 of the bubble tops sold in 1954, compared to less than 2,000 in 55, and only 603 in 56. Remember the shots of the Ford Thunderbird winning the acceleration from a standing start competition? It zoomed ahead of every other American production stock sports car. And you'll zoom ahead and stay ahead in your Ford, powered by the mighty Thunderbird V8 engine that's available in all Fords. In 1956, Ford kept the same basic line of cars as in 1955. You know, it's the widest, longest, lowest convertible in its field and the most popular. Fact is, since 1949, the Ford Sunliner has outsold every other convertible, regardless of price. Uh, with this one exception. But made the error of trying to market safety instead of cars. In today's post-Ralph Nader safety-conscious world, this might not seem so foolish, but with Chevrolet selling speed and power, would serve as a setback for Ford. That's why Ford V8s are the choice of police fleets from coast to coast. Why they're the most popular cars among those that demand extra performance and protection. In North Carolina, for example, all of the Ford patrol cars are equipped with all of Ford's lifeguard design features. Features you can have and should have in the car you drive. Ford's lifeguard steering wheel with a deep center construction to cushion impact and help prevent contact with the recessed steering column. Optional lifeguard padding on instrument panel and sun visors. Padded dash and sun visors cost $16 extra and factory installed seat belts cost $9. In 1957, Ford introduced a newly restyled and reorganized lineup available with either a six-cylinder engine or many choices of V8 engines and newly extended wheelbases of 116 and 118 inches. The lineup included Customs, Custom 300s, Fairlanes, Fairlane 500s, a Sunliner convertible, and 10 styles of station wagons, including two-door ranch wagons, four-door country sedans, the deluxe Country Squire, and the Del Rio. See? You're never late in a Ford V8. It's easy to see, isn't it, why the most popular station wagon in America is the new kind of Ford for 57. The new styling featured a rectangular full-width grille and tail fins over the king-size jet tube taillights that were sure to set a new industry trend. But perhaps the most innovative of all the new Fords was the new Fairlane 500 retractable. Here is the car of the future, the car that other manufacturers are still only dreaming about, the car that brings great prestige to Ford and Ford dealers for being first to offer the hard top design that within 10 years will be almost standard in the industry. Longer, three inches longer than the Fairlane 500 Sunliner, heavier, weighing almost 250 pounds more than its cloth top counterpart, 
The Fairlane 500 Hideaway Hardtop is the most beautiful car on the road today. Just about 50 seconds, less than a minute to change from a hardtop to an open-air car. The world's first and only true hardtop convertible. That's the Fairlane 500 Hideaway Hardtop. How is this miracle of automotive engineering accomplished? How in the world does it work? Seven small electric motors, permanently sealed and lubricated for their lifetime, provide the power to operate the fully automatic top. A system of limit switches operates the motors in sequence for safe, dependable operation. It's the car of the future, and once again, the industry will have to follow the leader, Ford. Ford sold over 20,000 retractables in 1957, but sales slacked off with fewer than 15,000 in 1958 and less than 13,000 in 59. It had virtually no trunk space when the top was lowered, was complicated mechanically, and cost $350 more than the convertible. Subtle changes marked the introduction of the 1958 Fords. A new bumper and grille combination combined with dual headlamps marked the major distinction from the 1957 models. This Paris mannequin is wearing a suit by Jacques Eim. The Ford's wearing a new idea, too. A new honeycomb grill. Only V8s were available, the most powerful versions extracting 300 horsepower from 5.8 liters. Introducing the greatest V8 engine advance in 25 years. The 1958 Ford's new Interceptor V8 with precision fuel induction. This is the mighty powerhouse that conquered the world and is now winning nationwide fame here on the American road. And despite a recession in 1958, Ford still sold nearly a million cars, possibly due to its advertising campaign that emphasized much of the line as the lowest priced. Ford sells America's lowest priced full-size station wagon. Ford sells America's lowest priced convertible. And Ford sells America's lowest priced full-size sedan. There's nothing newer in the world than the 58 Ford. In 1959, Ford opted to merely update what had been successful in 1958. Despite the outrageous designs of other manufacturers, Ford merely changed the grille and some of the moldings. The most dramatic change was the addition of the new Galaxy series, which included sedans, hardtops, and convertibles. The decisions in favor of conservatism paid off. 1959 marked the delivery of the 50 millionth Ford, and for the first time in this decade, Ford sold more cars than Chevrolet, moving into the number one spot. The Mercury line was formed in 1939 to produce automobiles with greater prestige than the Ford. It had always been well received. In the 50s, the Mercury was something better than a Ford and less than a Lincoln. The 1950 Mercury was basically a modest facelift of the style introduced in 1949. It was very similar to its Lincoln cousin, but sold for less. More powerful than a Ford, it was powered by a 255.4 cubic inch L-head V8. It was available as a two- or four-door sedan, a two-door wagon with wood trim, and a convertible. Also available was the Monterey, a dressed-up sporty coupe with special trim and a padded top. The 1951 Mercuries were only a scant facelift of the 1950 models. They had a semicircular crest and the name above the grille. They featured a different rear fender design and larger parking lights. Perhaps the best innovation for 1951 was the introduction of Mercomatic Drive, an optional two-speed automatic transmission. 
When you spend your money for a 1952 car, you want exactly that, a 1952 car, not last year's model with a facelift job. Here's a complete front to rear view of the new Mercury, and there's not a 1951 line in its body. Even the gas filler cap is in a more convenient location. And here's the difference between riding comfort and cramming. This new Mercury rear seat, six inches wider. Like modern airliners, Mercury is equipped with suspended brake pedals for greater leverage and smoother, no lurch stops. Now I'd like to show you what visibility means to your safety. Once, this was considered good vision, but not since the new Mercury hit the headlines. Here's how Mercury lets you see what's coming and where you're going. This is the actual size of the Mercury windshield. It's horizon wide. Rev up the most powerful V8 engine Mercury's ever had. The latest version of the engine that's famous for prize winning economy. Visit your Mercury dealer. Ask for a demonstration. Inspect the great new 1952 Mercury and the 1952 Mercury Monterey. You'll see why Mercury is the most challenging car for 52. In 1953, Mercury introduced two separate series. The Monterey was the top of the line, available as a sedan, hardtop, eight-passenger wagon, and convertible. While the lower-priced Custom was available only as a two- or four-door sedan or a hardtop. The Monterey sedans had luxurious broadcloth interiors, and the hardtops and convertibles had leather and vinyl. The bumpers sported bullet bumper guards, but otherwise, most of the 52 styling was retained. New options included power brakes and a four-way power seat. The 1954 Mercury had a new overhead V8 engine with 256 cubic inches and 161 horsepower at 4,400 RPM. A four-barrel carburetor was standard. Styling changes included wraparound taillights and a different grille. The model lineup remained the same except for the addition of the Mercury Sun Valley. This car with its plastic bubble top was designed as a cross between a convertible and a hardtop. It was beautiful but impractical. Even with a shade that could be drawn across it, the cars tended to stay too hot. This combined with its higher price tag accounts for its discontinuation in 1955. 1955 was an important year for Mercury. The line had all new styling, a new, more powerful engine, and was embraced by the public. Over 329,000 cars were sold. Montclair was the new top of the line, offered as a four-door sedan, hardtop, convertible, and Sun Valley. The middle of the line was the Monterey, available as a sedan, hardtop, and wagon. The Custom Series was the low end of the line, available as a two- or four-door sedan, hardtop, and wagon. In 1956, the Mercury line stayed basically the same as in 55, but with the addition of new side chrome moldings and still a larger V8 engine. To prove that Mercury leads its field in safety features, let's check some of the other safety-first design features built right into the Big M at no extra cost. Safety door locks. Safety Surge V8 engine, Safety Grip Brakes, Safety Beam Headlamps. In all, Mercury's Safety First design offers you more safety features than any other car in its class. Because inflation was causing prices to go up, a new inexpensive line was added, the Metalist. The Big M line, as it was referred to in its advertising, sold fairly well, especially the popular four-door hardtop called the Phaeton. Dream car. Dream car. It's a dream, dream car. car. Yeah,
1957 brought on a major redesign of the Mercury line on a new 122-inch wheelbase. New body and bumper designs accented the horizontal lines of the cars, and some of the most outrageous options ever available could be had on the Mercury, like the Seatomatic. Mercury's power seat that actually remembers your favorite driving position. Now here's how it works. Just set this dial on the dash to your favorite driving position. No more fumbling under the seat. Turn the ignition on, and the seat moves to the setting just right for you. Turn the ignition off, and it glides all the way back. Makes it easier for you to get in and out. But the star of 1957 was Mercury's dramatic expression of dream car design, the Turnpike Cruiser. From the big M, from Mercury for 1957, comes the Mercury Turnpike Cruiser, the most advanced automobile ever created for the American road. Flagship of the dream car fleet. The Mercury Turnpike Cruiser, called the most daring, most dramatically different car ever designed. The car with new ideas, dream car features, all as standard equipment at no extra cost. Instead of breathing air from exhaust pipe level, fresh air enters these draft-free vents here. The Turnpike Cruiser roof level air intake gently passes through the car, then out. The Turnpike Cruiser power operated back window. Press a button, the back window slides up and down. The Turnpike Cruiser dual curve windshield curves around and up, tinted to filter out the sun's glare with much more viewing area. Let you see overhead traffic lights without bending. The monitor control panel. Before you, the most complete panel of precision instruments ever designed. Even a new kind of steering wheel a full vision steering wheel, plus a tachometer to measure your engine's exact RPMs, and a computer to determine quickly average speed at any point on your trip. The Mercury Turnpike Cruiser. A big car, a powerful car, a beautiful car, and a car with all these features as standard equipment at no extra cost. But the cost of dream car design was too high, and many of the electrical options were unreliable. The Mercuries of 1957 didn't sell well. It's a dream car! Now, only seconds remain. Into position swings a symbol of a new age in advanced automotive styling and performance. Stand by. Closer. 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 1958 was not a kind year for any car in the middle-priced category. A recession cut back the market, affecting many makes, including Edsel and Mercury. And despite an attempt to make Mercury more affordable, sales overall were poor. The Turnpike Cruiser was moved into the Montclair line. And Park Lane was introduced as the new upper line Mercury, available in hardtops and convertibles. Mercury for 1958. The only car to bring you... Sports car spirit. More chrome accentuated what was basically a facelift to the 1957 models, and the multi-drive automatic transmission was available for the first time. In 1959, the Mercury line was simplified into Monterey, Montclair, Park Lane, and station wagons, 
with significantly fewer models of each. The Turnpike Cruiser and Medalist were discontinued. If I were you, I wouldn't try this on any other car with ordinary automotive paint. Now let's call out the fire department. See what happened? Nothing. The finish shines like a new silver dollar because this is Mercury's brand new super enamel. We tried to set fire to it just to show you how tough it really is. But despite all this, Mercury's super enamel finishes never need waxing. I repeat, Mercury finishes never need waxing. But these changes failed to save Mercury from its sales slump, and it was destined to end the decade much less successfully than it had begun it. These late 50s Mercuries have found a new and very appreciative audience in today's collector's market, however, where they are now more desirable and expensive than their better sold earlier counterparts. <laughs> By the end of the 1940s, Lincoln was still one of America's top luxury cars. But despite many modern options and creature comforts, they were bulky and slow. The Lincolns of 1950 and 1951 were large, rounded, bulbous things with sunken headlamps and grinning grills. Lincoln Cosmopolitan, the first car of the land. At a finger's touch, invisible servants leap to do your bidding. Cosmopolitan was the top of the line with a slightly longer wheelbase than the mainline Lincoln that shared some of Mercury's body panels. The more expensive Cosmopolitan had heavy chrome moldings over the front wheel wells and a more ornate front grille. Both cars used the 336.7 cubic inch L-head engine with optional hydromatic transmissions available. Your Lincoln dealer invites you to drive a Lincoln Cosmopolitan. The 1951 Lincolns featured longer rear fenders and the round taillights were replaced with upright styled ones. The front grille was simplified and a more powerful V8 engine was standard. Interiors featured a wide array of upholstery fabrics and leather. Yes, when you stop in at your dealers, you'll find a car that will take you places in the best of style. Lincoln Cosmopolitan, a premier product of the Ford Motor Company. You'll agree, nothing could be finer. As with the new Fords, 1952 introduced a completely restyled Lincoln. It was advertised as the one fine car deliberately designed for modern living. Right away, I was impressed with the fact that Lincoln is designed along the lines of modern architecture. Now, look at the large glass walls of this modern home. This is almost a must in modern design. Now, see how Lincoln fits right into the modern spirit of glass wall visibility. Back again to this house, you can see there's not a cluttered line to break the long, even flowing look. And you'll find the same simplicity and modern beauty in Lincoln, too. The emphasis was on modern, and much of that advertising was aimed at a female audience. But I got my biggest thrill when I slid behind the wheel and took Lincoln out on the road. It's just plain wonderful to drive. For instance, did you ever pass up a parking spot because you didn't want to go through a nasty struggle with a steering wheel? Well, Lincoln has something new that makes steering easier than ever before. I think they call it uh, ball joint suspension. <laughs> yes, that's it. Cosmopolitan became the secondary line, and Capri became the new top of the line. Both lines offered two- and four-door sedans, but only the Capri could be had as a convertible. A new superior valve-in-head engine was standard, with 160 horsepower and 317.5 cubic inches. Other features included a centralized gas cap and a wide curved windshield for greater visibility. Many interiors were available featuring modern fabrics and leathers designed to reflect modern living as you find it in the modern home. But Lincoln's performance in the Carrera Panamericana race in Mexico was the calling card to success, taking all five top places in the international standard class. And here it is, the one fine car powered to leave the past far behind. 
the new 1953 Lincoln, designed for modern living, completely powered for modern driving. With the new 205 horsepower overhead valve V8 engine, the Lincoln V205. Watch the new Lincoln V205 accelerate. Talk about getaway power when you need it. There's nothing on the road like the modern 1953 Lincoln. And there are many more power features available in Lincoln this year. Power brakes, tiptoe pressure is all you need to stop the car at any normal speed. Lincoln's power brake does the work your muscle used to do. Next, power steering, combined with ball joint suspension exclusive to Lincoln that turns this big car with a finger touch. Rolling along, you have normal feel of the wheel and the road. But in tight spots like this, when you need a helping hand, you get it. Lincoln's power steering cuts in automatically, takes over the work. Another new power feature available, and only in Lincoln, four-way power elevator seat. Not only does it go back and forth with the push of a button, believe it or not, it also goes up or down with the push of another button. Watch this. Push the button, and the seat goes to work to bring you good, safe, commanding vision. And the poor fellow, six foot plus, can now push a button and drive like this in the new Lincoln. He sits in solid comfort. And so do the passengers, surrounded with modern luxury, modern fabrics in glorious colors, finest interior appointments. And this year, Lincoln offers more color combinations than ever before. The richest look on wheels. Efficient, compact, with simple, graceful lines, the 1953 Lincoln, deliberately designed for modern living, is now completely powered for modern driving, with added comfort, convenience, and luxury for you. The 1954 Lincoln was only an update of the 1953 models, but contemporary advertising was quick to point out that it was designed for graceful styling without ostentation. You'll notice the lack of cumbersome bulges and flares on the 1954 Lincoln and just enough chrome to emphasize its modern horizontal line. It had a new rear bumper, and the new taillight assembly had the backup lights built in. As in the previous two years, they continued to emphasize Lincoln's visibility and the luxury of the interior, with fabrics ranging from silver thread nylon frise through broadcloths to the finest leathers in almost every color combination. The 1955 Lincoln was one of the most conservative cars available that year. Lincoln offered its own turbo drive automatic transmission for the first time. The styling was uncluttered and tasteful. Interiors were available in luxurious quality fabrics and leather. And remember, Lincoln proved its economy by coming home first in its class in the mobile gas economy run. And Lincoln captured the first four places in the stock car division of the rugged Pan American road race. So there it is, the car I think is the handsomest on the highway, and that experts have called the best in America. And you can call your own if you go soon, real soon, to see your neighborhood Lincoln dealer. Radically overhauled in an attempt to better compete with Cadillac, the Lincoln was changed into the long, low, and luxurious car that would be the trademark of Lincoln comfort and styling through the end of the decade. The wheelbase was extended to 126 inches with a longer and wider body style. Premier became the top of the line with Capri as the lower series. The new body style featured sleek horizontal lines accented by the simpler two-tone of body and roof. It won the Industrial Design Institute's Award for Excellence in Automotive Design. This new Lincoln came with a new 368 cubic inch V8 that could produce 285 horsepower at 4,600 RPM. This handsome and well-made car sold very well, having the added advantage of being the only completely restyled car for that year. 1956 also marked the introduction of the Continental Mark II. While it was technically manufactured by a separate division, its ties to the Lincoln line were unmistakable. It was based on consumer demand to replace the Lincoln Continental discontinued in 1948 and would later be integrated into the Lincoln line. It also capitalized on the existing Lincoln advertising venues and was sold by Lincoln dealers. The design of the Mark II of 1956 and 57 is unique and unmistakable, one of the all-time great design achievements. Its sleek and simple lines accentuated the luxurious and comfortable interiors. Ford had hoped that Continental would serve as a worthy opponent to Cadillac, 
But while Continental sales were okay, GM continued to lead sales in this upper price range. A really new, really dramatic fine car. From the trend-setting distinctive quadro lights and integrated grille, all the way down this longer than ever Lincoln, you'll find excitement of design never seen in an automobile before, ending with these dramatically canted blades. Add to this the effect of the pyramid taillights, the big backup lights, the clean design made possible by the hidden exhaust, and you have in Lincoln one of the most exciting statements ever made in automobile design. The inside story of the 1957 Lincoln is new too. Luxurious appointments, magnificent new leathers and fabrics, new conveniences, Yes, the new Lincoln is the most completely powered fine car ever built. And Lincoln for 1957 has the most powerful Lincoln engine ever. 300 horsepower, 10 to 1 compression ratio. Teamed with Lincoln's incomparable turbo drive for a great new driving experience. More than ever, unmistakably the finest in the fine car field. Lincoln for 1957. While 1958 didn't produce big business for Lincoln and Continental, it did produce some big cars. A completely restyled line of land yachts was introduced that was even longer, lower, and wider than the 1957 models. These monster cars were the largest American post-war production cars ever made. In this Ford film, a woman compares with measuring poles the width of the passenger seating in a Lincoln on the left and its chief rival, Cadillac, on the right. The same length poles that fit inside the Lincoln stick out of the Cadillac. Luxury, it seems, could be reduced to inches. This was one of many attempts by Ford to establish Lincoln as the American luxury car. The measuring poles confirm that Lincoln is a full four inches wider in the front and six and a half inches wider in the back. Another new addition was the Continental Mark III. It had a massive chromed front grille and huge flared bumpers. There were 145 interior combinations available, as well as 21 exterior colors and up to 103 two-toned options. It sold better than the Mark II, probably due to prices having been reduced from $10,000 in 1957 to $6,283 for the top of the line in 1958. But even so, sales were less than brisk, possibly because of the recession that was affecting sales in all the other divisions as well. In 1959, Continental introduced the Mark IV. Similar to the Mark III, it featured new bumper and body designs that accentuated the horizontal lines. But sales of Lincolns and Continentals continued to fall, with only about 27,000 cars selling in both divisions. This end-of-the-decade slump for Lincoln has had its turnabout in today's collector's circles, where these once unloved and unwanted cars have become some of the most desirable of today's collectibles. In 1955, Ford introduced its newest edition, the Thunderbird. A two-seater personal luxury car it was named after a legendary bird known to American Indians as a symbol for power, swiftness, 
and prosperity. No man, say the Indians, could see the Thunderbird except in flashes as it flew swiftly through the clouds with arrows of lightning bolts tucked beneath its wings. Here's a car designed for those who appreciate the distinctive in personal transportation, the new Ford Thunderbird, available with a smart convertible top and a sleek hard top. Beneath the hood is the Thunderbird special Y-block V8 engine with trigger torque power. Ask your Ford dealer about the new Ford Thunderbird. Thunderbird was the brainchild of Ford Division General Manager Louis D. Crusoe. He had attended a Paris auto show and had come back wondering why Ford didn't have a snazzy sports car in its lineup. Of course, the boom in U.S. purchases of European sports cars during the early 1950s might have had a bit of influence on Ford's decision to pursue this concept. It was further rushed into production when Chevrolet announced the introduction of the Corvette for 1953. Thunderbird was previewed and announced as early as February of 1954, but production did not begin until September. Designed primarily by Franklin Hershey, it was priced at only $2,944, with the V8 engine bored out to 292 cubic inches to produce nearly 200 horsepower. Power options included windows, brakes, seat, and steering. Compared to Chevrolet's Corvette, the more civilized Thunderbird was a huge success. Over 16,000 were sold in 1955. A classic design is ageless. It remains permanently new and exciting. Now, Ford presents the newest version of an automotive classic, the Ford Thunderbird for 1956. You'll recognize the beauty of line that in only one year has won the heart of all America. Improvements on the 1956 models included side air vents, visors, and the new 1956 steering wheel design to complement Ford's 1956 safety binge. Continental kits helped free up some of the scarce trunk space. Portholes were added to the hardtop to help with what had been a blind spot for the driver. The portholes would become one of Thunderbird's most talked about design elements. Owners of 1955 models could bring their cars in to have the new portholes installed. And a new dash design was added mid-year to further the safety of the car. 1957 was the last year for the two-seater Thunderbird. Redesigned from the 1956 model, it had tail fins similar to those on the Fairlane and a large combination bumper and grill. You're looking at the latest version of America's most talked about car. For 57, Ford has shaped the classic Thunderbird profile into a completely fresh, completely distinctive style all its own. New swept back tail fins and the longer rear deck add elegance to its lower than ever lines. These new dimensions give you more luggage room, too. Even with a spare tire inside, you get more luggage space than last year. You know, there's not another car like it in America. The 1958 Thunderbird was a radically redesigned automobile, an attempt to broaden its appeal by creating a four-seater personal luxury sports car. Almost a contradiction in terms. It was available as a hardtop for $3,631, or as a convertible for about $300 more. Watch, the rear deck lid has opened up. The power control top rises. Then disappears out of sight into the exclusive hideaway compartment. The rear deck lid hides it completely, and you have one flowing line of pure Thunderbird beauty. Here's a car that gives four people all the individual room and comfort of a much larger, costlier car, plus glamour and dazzling performance that's all Thunderbird all the way. There's never been any convertible at any price, anything like this new four-passenger Ford Thunderbird convertible. But the public lined up, proving the marketing people right. About 38,000 of the new T-Birds were sold. Thunderbird had another great year in 1959. Close to 70,000 Thunderbirds were sold, including over 57,000 hardtops and over 10,000 convertibles. For an additional $177, one could have the larger 430 cubic inch Lincoln power plant, which could provide 350 horsepower at 4,400 RPM. Thunderbird is possibly Ford's biggest success story in the 1950s. The cars were embraced by the public, cherished and loved. 
you still find many original Thunderbirds today still kept by their original owners. Thunderbird clubs have grown and flourished, and the cars are highly desired collector's items. But best yet, the Thunderbird line continues as a strong product for Ford, with no signs of it going away. The Thunderbird is here to stay. This is the Edsel, unlike any other car you've ever seen. This is the Edsel. This is the Edsel. This is the Edsel. This is the Edsel. You can see how it looks. You have to feel the power of the newest V8 engines in the world. The big new Edsel 400 and the larger Edsel 475. It is unlikely you have ever driven a car with so much usable power as the Edsel. And with Edsel's exclusive Teletouch Drive, you drive more safely, more easily than you ever have before. Because both hands can stay at the wheel while the Edsel shifts electrically. This is the Edsel, as its graceful flight deck and classic vertical grille suggest. It is elegant in every detail, and it acts the way it looks, but it doesn't cost that much. Edsel was a good idea at a bad time. When planning began on the Edsel in 1955, the demand for cars in this low to medium price range was booming, and Ford was hoping to fill the niche between Ford and Mercury. But three years later, 1958, was a year with its own problems. Unfortunately, one of the victims was the Edsel. When the Edsel appeared in late 1957, the market had already bottomed out. Under this canvas cover is one of the best kept secrets in the automobile business. We hope you'll help us keep it a secret until after the public showings. It's the newest member of the Ford family of fine cars, the Edsel. We have felt for a long time the need for a Ford Motor Company to have more effective coverage of the medium-priced field to enable us to reach our competitive goals. By all of us putting our best efforts behind it, we feel that the Edsel program will help us accomplish that aim. Ladies and gentlemen, the Ford Motor Company would like you to see the new styling, the new features of the beautiful new Edsel, newest member of the Ford family of fine cars. Could we see it? Certainly. You never saw a car like the 58 Edsel. Never? Never. More new ideas, more you. Ideas in the great, exciting new Edsel. Brake still on. You can tell in the Edsel when the light goes on. Engine cold. You can tell in the Edsel when the light goes on. Getting low on gas. You can tell in the Edsel when the light goes on. May we repeat? There's never been a car like the 58 Edsel. The car that presents originality and elegance never seen before in any car at any price and presents them in 18 different models. This expensive looking car is one of the Edsel Ranger series, a four-door ice green sedan styled like a hardtop that sells for no more than some models of America's low-priced cars. The turquoise and white convertible you see driving up now is one of the Edsel Pacer series with elegant Edsel styling throughout, such as these Edsel contour seats that are scientifically designed to give you separate back and shoulder support with an overall feeling of luxurious comfort that means hour upon hour of fatigue-free, enjoyable driving. And the back of the front seat is divided in a new way 
that gives the middle passenger a full backrest, so you ride more comfortably than you ever have before. This two-door hardtop is one of the large and luxurious cars in the Etzel Corsair series. Its colors are copper metallic and white, one of over 90 Edsel color combinations that you can choose from. So you can completely satisfy your individual color tastes. This ember red and white four-door hardtop is one of the magnificent Citation series, upholstered in white vinyl and gold nylon, just one of an attractive array of the very latest high fashion decorator fabrics, all color keyed to match the car exterior. Here is the distinctive Edsel Bermuda, done in charcoal brown and driftwood, one of five Edsel station wagons, which give you your choice of both two and four door, six and nine passenger models. And this is the Edsel Citation Convertible in gold and white. Undoubtedly the most beautiful convertible in the world. See this and the other elegantly styled Edsels at your Edsel dealer this week. Remember, this is the year to get out of your old car and into the most elegant automobile of your lifetime. Edsel sold for less than comparable Mercury's, spanning a price range of approximately $25 to $3,800. Possibly one of the biggest hurdles the Edsel encountered in its development was its name. Among some of the rejected ones were Mongoose Civique, Turncotinga, and Utopian Turtle Top. The name Edsel was adopted against the wishes of the Ford family, but at the insistence of Ford's chairman of the board, Ernie Breach. It was at best an awkward name for an automobile, and certainly lacked any of the romance, intrigue, or elegance traditionally associated with automobile marketing. And the Edsel styling was at best controversial, and at worst, thought to be plain ugly. The front vertical grille was compared to a beached bass. How does it feel to own an Edsel? It's like falling in love. You can read about it, hear about it, but you've got to feel it. Feel the thrill of owning an Edsel. Oh, your step is snappy. When you own an Edsel. Your pulse beats happy. When you drive an Edsel. Because you've got to drive it to feel what this great new car can do for you. You know why. It's a car designed around you. From the Ford family, a fine car. In 1959, with sales dropping, only Rangers, Corsairs, and Villager station wagons were offered on a 120-inch wheelbase. The grille was modified, and the cars were given an overall more conservative look. But the damage had already been done in the eyes of the buying public. Edsel would live on through 1960, but only to fulfill existing contracts. The best thing about the Edsel story is that it has a happy ending. No one thought that could ever be possible, but for all those mid-priced cars that were sold at the expense of Edsel's reputation, the Edsel stands today as one of the most desirable and loved examples of 1950s outrageous automotive styling. It's nice to know that the underdog can have the last laugh. Everybody in Edsel, everybody in Edsel, everybody in Edsel, in the whole territory. I just want to say, that's all, folks. Get the feel of the wheel of a boat. Settle back, take a man, hold tomorrow in your hand. Get the feel of the wheel of a boat. Get the feel of a wheel of a fair lane, you'll know what it means to fly. Get the feel of a wheel of a Lincoln, you'll really be riding high. Ford wagons and new Edsels, they'll take you anywhere. Ford Customs and 500s have luxury to spare. Ford Galaxies and Mercuries, you're up among the stars. 
Rise the mighty Thunderbird, the royalty of Mars. So to know how it 